Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at washingtech.com forward slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. President Obama speaks at South by Southwest. Lifeline reform goes on circulation. And Latif Matima is my guest. President Obama delivered a fireside chat-style keynote address at South by Southwest on Friday with questions posed by Texas Tribune Editor-in-Chief Evan Smith. As he acknowledged that many are distrustful of government, the president spoke about the administration's success at making the government more efficient with technology, such as students now having the ability to apply for student loans or seniors for Social Security online. Specifically, the president discussed the digital services program, which brings talent from other companies like Google and Facebook for a limited period of time to the government to help improve government technology. He also spoke about efforts to aggregate human genome data so scientists, policymakers, and others will be able to see the big picture. The president also spoke about his effort to ensure big data analytics and technology help to enable greater voter participation rates. We're the only advanced democracy in the world that makes it harder for people to vote. Um, no, I, I, you're laughing, but it's, it's sad. We take enormous pride in the fact that, that we are the world's oldest continuous democracy, and yet we systematically put up barriers and make it as hard as possible for our citizens to vote. And it is much easier to order uh, pizza or a trip than it is for you to exercise the, the, the single most important task in a democracy, and that is for you to select who's going to represent you in, in, in government. So, uh, so one of the things that we're doing is engaging uh, folks who are already doing interesting work in uh, the online space. How, how can we create safe, secure, right. s- smart systems uh, for people to be able to vote much easier online? And what are the technologies to help people get aware of what they're voting about, who they're voting for? Uh, that's, again, an issue where you don't want the federal government engineering all that. Right. But what we can do is to have in, uh, the incredible talent that's represented in this auditorium really spend time thinking about that and and getting to work on it. The president also addressed efforts the federal government has taken to address the digital divide. When we passed the Recovery Act, the stimulus that was very controversial at the time and that uh, continues to be criticized by the other party, uh, despite the fact that unemployment's now below 5%, and we avoided a, a Great Depression, but... Um, thanks, Obama. Um, the, uh, but, but Im- embedded in that was a uh, a massive investment in making sure that communities that had been left out of broadband and Wi-Fi. Yeah were reached. And uh, we have made enormous progress in extending uh, more and more uh, internet access, high-speed internet access to communities all across the country. A second example, we set up something called Connect Ed, where our goal, and we're on track to meet this by uh, 2018, is that 99% of classrooms have access to uh, high-speed internet 
wireless and and and, uh, and the way we've done that in part is through federal spending but what we've also done is we've partnered with a uh, uh, an array of companies. Right, private industry. Uh, private industry yeah. has really stepped up. The president also discussed open ebooks, which the White House announced earlier this month, which will allow Title I schools and teachers who teach on military bases or special education students to access leading children's ebook titles for free. The president also discussed the inherent policy conflict between the need for effective law enforcement and protecting privacy. The question we now have to ask is if technologically it is possible to make an impenetrable device or system where the encryption is so strong that there's no key, there's no door at all, then how do we apprehend the child pornographer? How do we solve uh, a or disrupt a terrorist plot? What mechanisms do we have available uh, to even do simple things like tax enforcement? Because if, in fact, you can't crack that at all, government can't get in, then everybody's walking around with a Swiss bank account in their pocket. He said there needs to be some concession for government to be able to access the information it needs to enforce the law. My conclusion so far is, is that you cannot take an absolutist view on this. So if, if your argument is strong encryption, no matter what, and we can and should in fact create black boxes, that I think does not strike the kind of balance that we have lived with for 200, 300 years, and it's fetishizing uh, our phones. Uh, above every other value. And that can't, be, uh, that can't be the right answer. The president concluded asking for deeper civic engagement. First Lady Michelle Obama will deliver the keynote at the opening of South by Southwest Music tomorrow. This year marks the first year across South by Southwest's 30-year history that a U.S. president or first lady has delivered remarks at the annual conference. The White House also announced last week it's a new opportunity project, a new open data initiative that seeks to improve economic mobility by making data sets more accessible to civic leaders, community organizations, and families. Key components include the launch of opportunity.census.gov, the release of a dozen new privacy sector and nonprofit digital tools, and public, private, and local partnerships. The project also includes a call to action, which calls on the public to develop additional tools. On Wednesday, the president took to Facebook to announce the administration's goal to get an additional 20 million more subscribers online by 2020. The president wrote about how a lack of broadband at home contributes to a homework gap, the very topic Susan Walters of the California Emerging Technology Fund and I discussed on last week's episode. The White House also released a report extolling the economic benefits of broadband access. The effort, dubbed Connect All, includes the Connect Home initiative, which aims to provide more affordable broadband at home, as well as supporting the FCC's goal of extending Lifeline to cover broadband. FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler and Commissioner Mignon Clyburn announced last week that they are circulating with other commissioners an order which would modernize the Lifeline program to include broadband. The order would entitle broadband subscribers to apply for a $9.25 per month subsidy to cover their broadband service, including voice. The commission set the speed that would be covered at up to 10 megabits per second down and 1 megabit per second up. Wheeler also announced in a Recode op-ed piece a new proposal to improve consumers' privacy safeguards when it comes to how ISPs use their data. Wheeler's plan is only the tip of the iceberg, however, as many retailers and others also collect vast information about us, including the federal government itself. Indeed, a Pentagon Inspector General report uncovered last week reveals a domestic drone spying program in which drones were used to conduct domestic spying operations up to 19 times between 2006 and 2015. No legal violations of the program were discovered. Recode has more. Apple Senior Vice President Craig Federighi wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post last week, rehashing his arguments for why the company should not have to comply with a federal court order to create special software that will enable the FBI to hack into one of the San Bernardino shooter's iPhones. Federighi said it would 
essentially open a Pandora's box, allowing hackers and others to access iPhones as well. Meanwhile, Edward Snowden, the former federal contractor who exposed the NSA's spying program, said via video stream that the FBI's assertion that it can't get into iPhones and that only Apple can deactivate passwords was bullshit. An ACLU report also said the FBI's claim was, quote, fraudulent because the FBI can easily work around the phone's auto erase feature. CNN Money gave us a glimpse last week of where the next frontiers of encryption and data protection will take us, citing Facebook and WhatsApp as examples. Currently, Brazilian authorities are seeking access to WhatsApp user data to conduct a criminal investigation, but WhatsApp is saying it can't provide the information Brazilian authorities need because the user data is scrambled. Finally, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg came out in support of President Obama's 2014 executive order to pause the deportation of 5 million undocumented immigrants. Zuckerberg signed on to a Supreme Court brief arguing the president's action was necessary because of the negative impact excessive deportation was having on productivity. 63 others signed the brief, including LinkedIn CEO Reid Hoffman, Redfin, Taqueria El Rincón Mexicano, and Me Too Network, a tech media company targeting young Latinos. The brief was filed in United States v. Texas, in which the state of Texas is seeking to halt the executive action. The Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in the case in April. Stay with us. And Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. How about Content Inc.? How entrepreneurs use content to build massive audiences and create radically successful businesses by Joe Polizzi. You can download Content Inc. or another audiobook free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day trial today at washingtech.com forward slash book. My guest today is Latif Matima, professor of law at the Howard University School of Law. And after graduating with honors from Amherst College, Professor Matima received his JD degree from Harvard Law School, where he was the co-founder and later editor-in-chief of the Harvard Black Letter Journal. He is admitted to the New York and Pennsylvania bars and has practiced intellectual property, bankruptcy, and commercial law, including a decade in private practice with the international law firm of Kudert Brothers. Currently a member of the Advisory Council for the United States Court of Federal Claims, Professor Matima has held the post of Distinguished Libra Visiting Scholar in Residence at the University of Maine School of Law, is a past president of the Giles S. Rich Inn of Court for the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and was a member of the founding editorial board for the American Bar Association Intellectual Property Periodical Landslide. Professor Matima is the founder and director of the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice and an accredited non-governmental organization member of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Latif Matima. Latif, welcome to the show. Joe, thanks so much. It is a privilege to be here. So we're here today to learn more about the complex world of intellectual property, but we're going to add a new layer. Latif Matima joins me to talk about the social justice implications of IP laws and regulations and how they can be crafted to ensure underrepresented groups are able to participate in a more meaningful way. So thanks again for joining me. What is the context that we're talking about here when it comes to the intersection between social justice and intellectual property. Can you give us a general sense of how you think about this issue? Yes. Well, I find it helpful in explaining what intellectual property social justice is, is to begin by explaining what intellectual property social justice is not. Um, Many people react to the phrase in particular ways, and by clarifying what intellectual property social justice is not intended to do, I find that it enables the discourse to go a little easier, a little cleaner. So there are two important points. The first one is that intellectual property social justice 
it is not intended to destroy the intellectual property system. It is not intended to undermine the mechanism of IP incentives and providing IP artists and innovators and creators and owners. It's not intended to do away with all of the property benefits and incentives that are part of that system. Another thing that intellectual property social justice is not, it is not a theory that looks at IP protection or IP deficiencies as something that can be addressed with a kind of one-size-fits-all approach. Oftentimes when discussing matters of intellectual property social justice, with IP practitioners and IP owners, you, you often hear responses along the lines of folks in the patent field will say, well, I can certainly see how there may be a need for some adjustments insofar as copyright is concerned. After all, copyright uh, is very important in terms of access to information, access to education, but I can't see how you could do any of that in the field of patent. And of course, uh, oftentimes you'll hear people in the area of copyright saying, well, I can certainly understand the need for some sort of social justice oriented theory in IP to address patent issues such as access to medicines, access to health, but certainly you shouldn't have IP social justice mechanism in the field of copyright. IP social justice would not treat all IP interests and all IP social deficiencies as the same thing and much in the same way that the IP regime is custom tailored to fit a variety of intellectual property endeavor, IP social justice does the same thing. So to give now a more affirmative, more positive um, definition and description of IP social justice, IP social justice is simply about the acknowledging that there are various social justice obligations that are intrinsic um, as an aspect of intellectual property uh, protection. And these intrinsic obligations can be summarized as uh, precepts of access, inclusion, and empowerment. Basically, what the theory uh, illuminates is that there are some IP-related social injustices or deficiencies which can and should be addressed as a matter of IP law and policy. This may seem apparent um, at first blush, but typically one of the arguments in the past, particularly in the 20th, throughout much of the 20th century, has been if there are a variety of social deficiencies that happen to all also involve some IP law and policy, you should not address those issues by tinkering with the IP law. These should be treated exclusively as matters of social welfare. And so if some people don't have appropriate access to information, then perhaps we ought to come up with some charity or pass a law that will provide uh, poor communities uh, with payment uh, for books. Or if there are some people who can't afford their medicines, we should deal with that exclusively through some sort of health care remedy, some sort of health subsidy. But we should not tinker with the IP law. And IP social justice takes the opposite view. IP social justice looks at, for example, in, in, the, in the United States, the underlying premise and authority for intellectual property protection. Uh, comes from Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which specifically provides that the purpose of the intellectual property law is to promote the progress of the arts and sciences. And so what IP social justice does is that it takes a look at various um, IP-related uh, social deficiencies, and if there is such a situation that actually impedes the progress of the arts and sciences, then that is a situation that need not be addressed solely as a question of social wel welfare, but in fact, we're obligated uh, to address that situation as a problem of IP protection and to make certain that the objectives of the intellectual property law are being satisfied 
by dealing with and eradicating that um, social uh, deficiency. Uh, probably what I can do best to illustrate it is to give a, a typical historical example. For example, if we look at some of the problems that we have historically found in the entertainment industry, for example, of various uh, minority artists, creators, writers, performers being deprived of the economic fruits of their contributions. If you have a situation in which certain segments of the national populace, certain communities are finding themselves routinely excluded from the benefits of uh, intellectual property endeavor, then these communities are going to be less likely to step up to the plate and to make their contribution to the intellectual property national storehouse. So when you have such a situation, it is society and society's interest in promoting the, art, the progress of the arts and sciences. That is what is being injured under those circumstances. I used to always say when I first coined the phrase intellectual property, social justice, more than a decade ago, that if George Washington Carver had never been exposed to a peanut, it is not George Washington Carver who would have suffered. It's not the African-American community that would have suffered. It would have been our nation as a whole, and indeed much of the world, that ultimately came to benefit from his scientific developments and discoveries. So IP social justice looks at the IP law uh, through that lens and seeks to achieve the objectives of intellectual property law and to restore them when they have been impeded by various um, social and social injustice um, conditions. Now let's turn to the value of the internet as opposed to traditional uh, channels for, uh, for content producers to disseminate their work you know some most people are a lot of people who listen to this podcast some more more so than others are familiar with my own story of being laid off from a think tank and then deciding to start my own business the main product of which is this podcast so you know 15 or 20 years ago this podcast would never have been possible what are some examples of institutional licensees such as record labels taking advantage of and in some sense exploiting the work of artists and inventors that's that that's an excellent question an excellent point prior to the um, advent of the internet when we were still in an analog age the developers of intellectual property output be it uh, copyright output expressive output or uh, patent oriented output. Uh, pretty much the creators, the artists, the inventors, the innovators, they were all almost completely dependent upon middleman distributors. So you could be the most creative artist on the planet and you could develop the, the most interesting content, the most valuable content, the most thought-provoking content. But the fact of the matter is, is that you had no means uh, to commercialize and commercially distribute that uh, expressive uh, product. Uh, as a result, many of the individuals, and the entertainment industry is, a, is an excellent um, example of it, would enter into a wide variety of industry con uh, contracts which would deprive them of almost all of the economic value. We have some of the, the famous anecdotal tales of uh, early rock and roll and R&B artists from the African-American community creating a song that ultimately went on to earn millions of dollars. And the artist initially uh, signed away all of the rights uh, to that uh, to that material, sometimes for a car, sometimes for a few hundred dollars, sometimes for something as small as a meal, an opportunity to have some, something to eat. Uh, the internet, of course, uh, obviates this situation. Uh, with the internet, artists now have the opportunity to distribute their content directly to the people. You can take your stuff to market. And you can not only get your product out there, you can, in fact, utilize the Internet to create your market. Uh, YouTube, for example, is a wonderful example of this. There are many individuals 
who, step one, they come up with some expressive content. It could be a song, a poem. It could simply be the way that they perform some pre-existing uh, copyrighted uh, material. No one knows who they are. No one is familiar with their product. They then get themselves onto YouTube. They share this expressive output uh, with folks, just people. People begin to see for themselves how important this work is. People enjoy it for themselves. People pass it on through word of mouth uh, as opposed to the traditional analog market building uh, mechanisms in which you had to pay your record company or your movie distributor um, huge amounts of money to market and to advertise your work. You can do all of that now yourself. You can build your market on, on your own, you can determine who your markets uh, are. Um, and so the internet has completely altered that situation such that now, particularly artists and, and others and writers and uh, people like yourself, you're no longer limited to one particular form of mass distribution. Another benefit that we have to keep in mind is that sometimes even the highly inequitable and unfair deal was not even available. In other words, if you went to the uh, commercial distributor and you have a product, you have some expressive output that you would like to get to the national marketplace, if that individual, if that entity did not believe in the commercial viability of your product, they would not distribute your product at any place. And so you also had a kind of unintentional censorship of the marketplace. You had to please this particular channel in order to even get your work out there for people to be able to be exposed to it. This, too, has now been uh, removed by the advent of, of the Internet. So when it comes to intellectual property empowerment as a tool for moving underserved uh, communities and marginalized communities forward, uh, both in terms of their economic capability, their ability for self-determination, their ability uh, to uh, share uh, expressive content, political speech, all of those things, the internet has just absolutely rev revolutionized the opportunities that, that are available. And you filed some comments with the U.S. Intellectual Property Coordinator last year, and in them you referenced a case in Ray NCAA, the Ed O'Bannon case that came down uh, from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which held that the National Collegiate Athletic Association, NCAA, exploits student-athletes in their recruitment and student-athlete compensation scheme. Can you tell us a little bit more about that case, the facts leading up to it, and what the legal regime is now governing the relationship between universities and student-athletes? This is just an incredible um, history, and it is probably one of the most important and pivotal developments in um, the intellectual property system in the, in the United States. Uh, basically, uh, what has been the situation for many decades, and, and most people are relatively familiar, with the mechanism whereby student athletes, uh, they are recruited by colleges and then they sign um, agreements whereby basically they agree, we will play uh, football and basketball, whatever the sports may be, and in exchange for which uh, we will receive a college education. Now, putting aside as to whether or not many of these athletes actually get the college education they were promised, but even assuming that in some circumstances that that, that, that happens, what happened in later years in uh, the middle of the 20th century and, and going forward is that athletes, student athletes, were then also required to give up something additional. In addition to playing for the school, uh, they also had to agree to sign away their intellectual property rights, in particular, uh, their rights to commercially exploit um, their um, personal identities. Basically, what this did was that it, it put the colleges and universities in a position that they could then uh, either tape uh, uh, games and competitions um, and then uh, 
sell or license those uh, tape recordings to other entities, which ultimately evolved into the modern uh, circumstance in which uh, major television networks, they buy the rights to be able to come in and to film and to televise uh, these games. And of course, we all know that generates millions upon millions of dollars in, in revenue. By virtue of the agreements that student athletes are required to sign, however, uh, the student athletes are deprived and indeed legally prevented from obtaining any part of those revenues at all. And we can see how this, in many cases, leads to a highly inequitable bargain. Well, in the O'Bannon case, what happened was that, and, and there were multiple litigations going on at all at the same time, there were some litigations that focused on whether or not the uh, these sorts of uses, televised broadcasts, and then also uh, uh, video games uh, that would create avatars of players. There was some litigation dealing with whether or not the student-athletes have publicity rights in those contexts. And if they do have publicity rights, they become property rights that others are not entitled to exploit without without their permission. So those cases went on for a number of years. And ultimately, um, the two leading, uh, two of the leading circuits, uh, the Ninth Circuit and then uh, the Third Circuit, both handed down decisions uh, that agreed that uh, student athletes do in fact have publicity rights in those circumstances and those rights ought to be respected. Now, the companion litigation to this is the O'Bannon antitrust litigation. And the antitrust litigation came at the problem from a different uh, perspective. And that pointed out that even though the courts have recognized that, yes, student athletes do have publicity property rights in this, in this context, uh, by virtue of the practices of the NCAA, which require students and the member schools to enter into these agreements whereby the students are obligated to give away their publicity rights, to give them to the uh, colleges and universities without any uh, remuneration, that that was an antitrust violation because the students have no other opportunity. There is no other market. They must deal with uh, these institutions. They're, they're not allowed to market their services to any other potential buyers. Um, ultimately, um, in initially, what the um, California District Court did at first was to look at the situation to find that, yes, indeed, there is an antitrust violation here. There is a restraint of trade, but simply by given the, the fact that if you have these services, if you are a student athlete and you want to sell these services, well, you're limited. You can only sell to a member of the NCAA. Uh, what the California court did was to fashion a remedy and to say that, well, one way that we can address this, we could uh, invalidate these agreements altogether, but the schools have introduced evidence that this system is helpful to competition, to promote student, uh, uh, um, uh, student participation in um, – uh, sports, uh, rather, uh, it, it, it promoted amateurism, uh, not competition, amateurism in, in student sports, that you have a much better type of athletic experience for students if they weren't involved in commercial activity. So balancing the interest of amateurism versus the national interest in promoting competition, the California District Court fashioned a remedy whereby these agreements could be upheld provided that the schools gave the students some comp compensation for their IP rights. And that compensation could be up to $5,000 a year. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, the Ninth Circuit had difficulty with that part of the California court's uh, decision in that it did seem somewhat arbitrary. You know, where, where did we come up with this zero to $5,000 figure? But what became highly problematic was that the Ninth Circuit, rather than remanding this back to the California District Court – 
uh, with an instruction to say that, well, we see that this mechanism, it does violate competition, but your method for providing a remedy, that's somewhat arbitrary. Go back to the uh, drawing board and come up with something that's less arbitrary. Instead, the uh, Ninth Circuit, um, utilizing what many scholars feel or a, a poor interpretation of antitrust law, decided that not only is the mechanism fashioned by the California court inappropriate, but went so far as to decide that any remedy would be inappropriate. In other words, to provide the student athlete with any payment of any kind, that that would be a violation because that would be a violation of the principles of amateurism, notwithstanding the negative impact that it has on competition. So in effect, what you have is a Ninth Circuit ruling basically disemboweling the important aspects of the victory that the students won in the California District Court and basically saying antitrust, federal antitrust law, it's the rule of the land, it's the law of the land, except if you have an extremely profitable industry that is dependent upon exploiting the rights of a particular group. Well, then in that case, we're going to say that the interest of that industry in, quote, amateurism um, supersedes the interest of the nation in uh, federal, federally protected uh, competition. So unfortunately, that's where we are at this point in time in terms of at least the Ninth Circuit. So on the one hand, throughout the nation, most courts have acknowledged that student-athletes do have uh, publicity rights, and those rights should be recognized. Unfortunately, when you take it to the next step, well, what happens when students are forced, as a result of the NCAA rules, to give those rights away when they sign these agreements uh, to play ball uh, for the school? What do we do about that fact? What do we do about the fact that they have no other choice? Normally, uh, you would be able to redress that issue through the antitrust law. The Ninth Circuit has now held that, well, you can't uh, because we think that the, the uh, preservation of amateurism is more important than competition in this particular context. The good thing, however, is that so far this is a ruling only of the Ninth Circuit. The, uh, this issue has not been litigated in other circuits, and so there's still very much an opportunity uh, for another court uh, to decide differently. So let's move to the issue of net neutrality, Latif, an issue currently being litigated in the D.C. Circuit, in which internet service providers are challenging the FCC's use of its ancillary or Section 706 authority, and are seeking to strike down the FCC's net neutrality rules. These rules prevent internet service providers from blocking, throttling, or entering into paid prioritization schemes with certain content providers. How is the issue of net neutrality important for underrepresented entrepreneurs and content creators? And how do the net neutrality rules and policies around intellectual property play off each other? Well, that's a very important issue. You see, the problem is that today, if you are not on the internet, in many respects, you don't exist. Uh, You can't really reach any significant audience. So being on the internet is, is critical. Now, getting on the internet is not uh, especially difficult anymore. Um, building a website, doing a blog, getting your content out there, that is something that is uh, within the reach of many Uh, budding entrepreneurs, even those from marginalized and underserved communities. Uh, But now comes the net neutrality problem. What if the people who are users of the internet, the customers, the people that you want to reach, uh, each person pays a differing fee in terms of what type of internet service they have, what types of bells and whistles uh, come, come along. In the absence of net neutrality, you could determine who gets what material at what speed. 
And this could work on either end. So if I am a user of the internet and I want to connect with certain content, if I am not paying the premium price for the premium speed, then there'll be certain types of content that will come to me at a much slower rate. And in some cases, this means it'll come in stops and starts and that sort of thing. I may as well not be getting it at all. Of course, we have to think about the other end of the spectrum as well. If you are an internet user in the sense that you are using the internet to distribute content, if you can't afford to pay the premium price, then it means that your content when it goes out, it's going to be relegated to slower speeds, back channels, if you would. And again, it's going to be that much more difficult for you to get your, your content out. So one of the potential problems uh, in the area of net neutrality is that we could remove many of the benefits that we discussed earlier that the Internet brings to the marketplace, particularly in terms of marginalized and underserved communities. In effect, if Disney can afford to pay the highest price to move its material such that it doesn't matter who's on the other end, Disney can afford to make certain that it pays the highest price to move its content such that you don't even need to worry about what people on the other end are being charged then it means that Disney's material will always move and that will be the material that everyone on the internet has the universal access to, will always have access to, and in effect, it could crowd out other distributors in, in the marketplace. And obviously, um, entrepreneurs and others from marginalized and underserved communities, they're not going to be able to compete with that. And so we end up right back in the situation that we were in, in the analog society. There are those who cannot afford uh, the cost of international, uh, rather uh, uh, international and national um, distribution of their content. Indeed, if you want to make certain that your content reaches the broadest possible audience, then in that example that I gave, that hypothetical I gave, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to figure out how can you make a deal with Disney so that Disney now will include your content within its package, which is moving now at the highest possible speed. So we would have just recreated the situation that we dealt with with the record companies in terms of um, entertainment in, uh, throughout much of the 20th century. And now we have the problem of zero rating in which uh, some of the ISPs are entering into agreements with some of the video services like Netflix and others uh, to prioritize their content on channels that, are, that they regard as separate from the internet. Is, am, I, am I on the right track in describing uh, zero rating? Yeah, and you know, a, a very important observation about that is that this helps us to understand what the dynamics are. In other words, content is king. Content providers, they're the ones who can be in control of this situation. If a content provider says to an ISP, I am not going to allow you to have my content unless you agree that my content is going to move at this speed, under these circumstances, et cetera, et cetera, well, then there's nothing that the ISP can do about that. So net neutrality can end up uh, protecting uh, users and also protect the integrity of the internet such that basically the powerhouse entrenched conglomerate content owners that they can't in effect throw their weight around. Latif, thanks so much for joining me. There's so many issues that we can't even begin to get to today, but it's really been a pleasure. Now I want to shift gears in the conversation and ask you a few more questions and then we'll close. Sound like a plan? Absolutely. All right. This podcast is about policy, but it's also about what makes successful people tick and what we can learn about what constitutes success in the intellectual and policy spheres and how to generate a greater sense of fulfillment from our work. So how about you, Latif? What are some things, and they can be apps, tools, or habits, tactics that you use to stay on top of your game? Well, certainly one of the things that, particularly in my field, being that my focus is in intellectual property with a particular emphasis on copyright, uh, having access uh, to the material that's available to you daily on the internet, 
uh, has just revolutionized my ability to stay on top of things. Um, when I was uh, in practice throughout the 80s and 90s, uh, much of these tools were not available to us at that time. Uh, if you wanted to do research, if you wanted to keep abreast of the latest developments, uh, that information, you would have to subscribe to a wide variety of paper services. You would have to pull each book off of the shelves. You would have to laboriously flip through each page, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, digital information technology and the Internet has absolutely changed all of that. Uh, one of the things that I marvel at is the fact that I can now ask a very uh, specific question uh, either orally or you know, type it in as a search inquiry, and there it is. The answer, in fact, multiple answers, are immediately made available to me. And so both as a practitioner and as a law professor and scholar, uh, this has made just an absolutely extraordinary difference. And tell me one book that you're recommending these days to basically everyone you meet. Yes, a very important book that I would recommend to everyone. It's a book called Diversity in Intellectual Property. It's published by Cambridge University Press and edited by an IP colleague, Irene Calboli. It is uh, really the only book to approach uh, the question of intellectual property protection and development from the perspective of diversity and um, including as many different contributors to the development of IP uh, output as, as possible. Latif, thanks so much once again for joining me on the show. What are some final thoughts you'd like to leave with the audience and where can we find you online? Well, I can be found online in a couple of places. I am, of course, on the uh, website for the Howard University School of Law, where I am a professor of law and the director of the Howard Intellectual Property Program. In addition, um, I'm also the founder and director of an NGO member of WIPO, and that is the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice. And you can find me there and find information about the Institute and the concepts of intellectual property, social justice, as well as a variety of programs, many of them free. You can find that there as well. I guess the final thought that I would leave is this. When it comes to intellectual property, as a result of the advent of digital information technology, and in particular the internet, we have an extraordinary opportunity. Intellectual property, both endeavor and output, it is really the greatest natural resource of the 21st century. It is the fuel that drives the development of all of our societies, our cultures, and our innovative uh, accomplishment. Because of digital information technology and the internet, we are no longer restrained by physical restraints as to who can participate in creating intellectual property, who can participate in distributing intellectual property, and how intellectual property can be used to empower underserved communities, to put them onto a track of self-help and self-determination, to move away from more of the sort of traditional welfare society aid in, in those communities. And I think that what we all have to do is to not only make use of these tools, but we need to be very vigilant and to be a part of the policy discussions and indeed the policy battles that will determine how well digital information technology and the internet is going to be used to promote our society as a whole. Years ago, Many of us were engaged in the SOPA and PIPA battles, and but for a great deal of grassroots public participation, uh, those legislative battles would have ended up very, very differently. So we as a people in the United States and indeed throughout the world, we will get not only the internet we deserve, but we'll get the internet that we are prepared to fight for. And that is something that I think that we all need to keep in mind. You have been listening to Latif Matima, professor of law at the Howard University School of Law and author of Intellectual Property, Entrepreneurship, and Social Justice, From Swords to Plowshares, which you can find on Amazon. Dr. Matima, thanks for joining me. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. 
And that concludes episode 30 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. I can't do any of this without you, so thank you. If you're new to the podcast, or even if you've been listening for a while, I invite you to subscribe to the weekly Data Points newsletter, which is a summary of relevant communications and media-related research that's been done recently, as well as related socioeconomic research. You can find the sign-up for that at the top of the page at washingtech.com. Thanks again to all of you for listening, and I will see you back here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 